Bottom line of this is that it was the first time we were able to go back and look and see at a pattern that flu epidemics, pandemics, will demonstrate over the course of the rest of the history. That is, it pops up in an area, seems to run its course, dies down, pops up in a second area, always seems to be a bit stronger and more widespread the second go around, and really potentially can then pop up again later. And so it's a lesson that health and human services and public health people have really taken to heart as we think about how we approach what we do now for flus. So that all being said, let's get back to 1918. That says that there was 1,000 people who died per month from June to May, in June of 1918 to May of 1919. Again, spike in November, spike in March. Isn't this what we think is going to happen this year around? So let's fast forward to 1957. We're talking about the Asian flu. Again, look at the number of deaths worldwide. And when you think about the 1918 flu, the percentage of deaths, that was probably a huge amount of the population. We have one to two million deaths, still a pretty good chunk of the population in 1957. This is an H2N2. Asian flu, same thing happened. People developed immunity. Younger people developed immunity, not so much people over 65. This is one of those flus where the elderly really took the big hit. Took the big hit, and the same thing happened. Now, in 1957, though, we were starting to be able to identify these things, track these things a little bit more. The elderly took the big hit, but who do you think were the transmitters? The transmitters were school-age children. They're the people who, in November, the fall, went back to school. Again, no good hand hygiene. Who have heard of hand hygiene back in 1957? No good cough etiquette. They brought the disease home to them. And in 1957, our culture was still such that, for, to a large degree, the elderly were cared for in their home by their family. Bingo. Vaccines started to become available in, in the 1957 flu. Technology was starting to happen, but really not enough to make a big difference at this point in time. So the pattern here was the young people were the transmitters, spread it to the older folk. The old folk took the hit in terms of, of dying. And health officials began to start paying attention and began to develop techniques for tracking this. 1968 Hong Kong flu, H2N2. You see the numbers up here. You see why it was not quite as big a deal. Medical care was, was good. We had developed ways in which to attack pneumonia, which the secondary pneumonia is often the leading cause of death. Again, same thing as in 1958, oh, the 1957 flu here. The young children were the transmitters, the carriers. They're the people who spread it along. Older folk are the people who, 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 who died. Same thing. They found less people. Look at the number, 700,000 as, as compared to 1 to 2 million worldwide. And here's one of the reasons. They thought this was just 11 years after the previous flu, and so people still had a, a great deal of immunity. Now, here's a funny thing about how things have gone since 1968, Hong Kong flu, and now, and I'll just you know, do a little personal aside here. In 1968-69, I hate to say it, I was graduating from high school. Do you think I had a clue that the Hong Kong flu was like a big deal? No. I was a teenager, locked in my own little world, thinking about graduation in Vietnam. That was the big news of the day. In 1968-69, flu epidemics and pandemics were not the big news of the day. How much different it is today. 1997, avian flu, starting to sound familiar now, starting to know where we're at and, and think back of how the press has gotten involved with things and how we've been able to track this. Avian flu, obviously birds, 
Started in Southeast Asia and China, huge epidemic over there. Huge, to the point where in order to cull that, in order to stop that spread, huge populations of ducks, birds, chickens, hens, etc., were all massacred, burned, slaughtered to prevent the transmission. It seems to have worked because we don't talk so much about avian flu anymore. This was one of the cases where we first saw or first recognized transmission from a wild animal, a wild species, to humans. Thankfully, not very often does that happen. And thankfully also, human-to-human -human transmission has not become a big prevalent part of this. Still concern about birds and, and the risk of avian flu. To the point where in Southeast Asia, China, Indonesia, the, the CDC and the World Health Organization is still tracking that and still noting on a year-to-year -year basis there's a small increase in the incidence of avian flu. So avian flu has not gone away. Talked about this already. 433 cases, 262 deaths. It's not the hot topic anymore. But again, as I said, we're still worried about it, and when we talk about this year's H1N1, it has played into it. So, lots of books to read, lots of things to look at. Those of you who are interested in that can Google you know, the flu vaccine and can just look at great reading, very interesting stuff. We're going to take a five-minute bathroom break. There may be some questions and related coming up here. But let's take a break, get up, stretch, go to the bathroom, but no fear going to get your pillow.